Assalamu alaikum everyone. My name is Rehan Ali. I'm the executive assistant here at Imana. Uh, we have today our webinar. Uh, the topic is the medical side of Islamic health. Um, and we have our speaker here today, Dr. Ember Khan, who will be presenting us with this webinar. Um, just real quick, I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, Dr. Ember Khan. Uh, Dr. Ember Khan graduated from West Virginia School of Osteopathic Medicine. Um, after graduating, she went on to pursue health education. Uh, she has been a Muslim youth health educator for over 11 years. Um, she teaches health education at schools and community centers focusing on physical, social, and mental, reproductive, and sexual health education. She has also been the chair, uh, and she's the chair of the education committee for the Islamic Medica uh, Medical Association of North America, Imana, for the past four years. Mashallah. And uh, Dr. Khan also holds an associate's degree in Islamic studies from uh, Mishka University. She has focused her studies on Akhida and Dawah. She has led halakhas at her local masajids and college universities for the past 10 years. She, uh, as in an educator for new Muslim classes at Muslim Enrichment Project and a volunteer Muslim chaplain at Muslim, uh, volunteer Muslim chaplain at women correctional facilities. She currently leads a weekly youth sisters halakha in Canton, Michigan uh, for, the for the past five years. Also, Dr. Khan has written the first health curriculum for youth called Islamic Health, which we'll be discussing today. It is a textbook series with two volumes, book number one for ages nine and up and book two for ages 14 and up. This series is the first of its kind to tackle the most common health concerns by putting the Islamic way of life at the forefront of its, of its answers and centering the Muslim narrative. Inshallah, she will be discussing her book series, Islamic Health, and provide a brief overview of the medical side of the series. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce to you Dr. Amber Khan. Bismillah. Thank you, Rehan. Thank you, Imana, for the opportunity to present tonight. Um, this week is actually Sexual Health Awareness Week, so it ties in very much with the topic tonight, which is on the book Islamic Health. So after medical school, I went into health education, as Brother Rehan mentioned. And when I started out, I taught health at Islamic schools for several years. And the following are some real questions from my middle and high school age students. How do I know when my period is done so I can continue praying? If I'm touched in a way I don't like, will Allah blame me for being immodest? Is watching pornography haram? I tried alcohol before. Does that make me a bad Muslim? I feel sad sometimes. Is something wrong with my faith? These questions with their all-encompassing honesty and maturity, they provide us with insights into the young American Muslim mind, but they were also health-related and therefore relevant to the class I was teaching. Now, a typical middle and high school health class is commonly called sex education, but it's so much more than that. It tackles all areas of health reproductive, sexual, physical, social, mental, spiritual health, and topics within these areas are endless. There's puberty, sex, relationships, bullying, self-esteem, body image, diet, exercise, drugs, violence, pregnancy, contraception, suicide, the list just goes on and on. This class, it's vital for all youth, which is why it is a required course for a majority of American public schools. Most of the time, health class is taught in ninth grade, and then there's usually a small health session or a seminar offered in fifth grade. Elizabeth Nash, she's the Senior States Issues Manager at Gutmacher Institute, and she said, sex education is about life skills. There are so many aspects you take with you for the rest of your life, but you only get it once or twice in school. Health class or sex education, it's also one of the most controversial classes in many countries. There's ongoing debates on whether they are, on if they are even permit, permissible to teach it, on if it needs to be medically accurate, age appropriate. Um, some programs are abstinence only, where they only teach um, sex after marriage, but nothing else, whereas others are more comprehensive. So the health class curriculum actually varies from one state to another and it simply depends on the state that you're in that determines what the curriculum is going to be. 
That being said, most health classes taught are comprehensive, medically accurate, and age appropriate. And Muslim youth should be allowed and encouraged to benefit from this class. Islam is a religion that encourages its followers to take wisdom from all people and cultures. As Abu Hurairah and he narrated that the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, the word of wisdom is the lost property of the believer. Wherever he finds it, he is most deserving of it. Just as Muslims can benefit from all societies and their knowledge of engineering or chemistry, for example, there's no problem in taking good and beneficial knowledge regarding health from different cultures as well. And in fact, even the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him did so himself. He said, alayhi salam, I was about to forbid you from having intercourse with your wives while they were breastfeeding children, but I saw that the Romans and Persians did that and it did not harm their children. So Muslim youth taking health class at their local public school, it provides them in most cases with a lot of benefit that can help them navigate that time in their life as well as as they are approaching adulthood. But based on my personal experience in teaching at an Islamic school while using a public school health textbook and curriculum, I found that it does pose a couple of drawbacks, two of which are number one, that Muslims have their own unique rulings towards certain health issues that would not be addressed or would be missed out on by Muslim youth. For example, the jurisprudence or fiqh rulings regarding menstruation, Islamic hygiene, the benefits of fasting, being able to break cultural stigmas of mental health, sexual violence, as well as social justice issues, why and how to abstain from sex or living a sober life from a spiritual standpoint, the mental and social health aspects of Islamophobia, as well as contemporary issues. Now, these topics, of course, are not to be taught in a secular setting, of course, um, so they would need to be supplemented and addressed by the Muslim child's parents, or at least provided by their local Muslim community by having a youth night or a halakha or a talk on these topics. And of course, there are challenges that come with doing so. Who is teaching it? Is it medically accurate? These topics are quite sensitive. Um, so it does cause some, some issues in that regard. The second drawback that I noticed about the public school health curriculum is that some of the lessons did contradict some Islamic principles. For example, it didn't consider or value discussing topics with moral boundaries, which if done so can encourage, for example, sexual responsibility and give the ability for Muslim youth to develop strong decision-making skills. It also prioritizes personal autonomy and self-desire, whereas health taught from an Islamic perspective, it can emphasize the concept of a relationship with a higher being, as well as with those around us. For example, fulfilling parental rights, Muslim rights, non-Muslim rights, taking care of those in poverty, orphans, the environment, those with disabilities, as well as advocating for anti-racism and women's rights. Because of these issues, then what do American Islamic schools do when it comes to teaching health? Like what does their health class look like? So they're usually, and this is generally speaking, but they usually fall into two boats. So they either offer no class, they leave it entirely up to the parents to teach them about health, or they do have a health class, but they simply base it off of an abstinence only health curriculum, right? They limit the topics, especially topics on sex. Um, you know, don't talk about sex, but they don't explain, or sorry, they say don't have sex, but they don't talk about why or how to do that, or alcohol is prohibited, but do, fail to explain the wisdom behind it. There's absolutely no discussion on mental health or suicide or social health issues like racism and misogyny. This can lead Muslim youth with simply a lack of understanding on issues that they are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, which can lead to a failure to offer proper decision-making skills or critical thinking skills to an array of sensitive topics, as well as put them at a higher risk of risky behavior. Research shows that abstinence-only sex education programs are simply ineffective, and they actually pose a greater risk to the youth overall. Um, the second way that health is taught in an Islamic school is that they do teach a comprehensive health curriculum. They use their local public school's health textbook, um, and they discuss all areas of health. This was my case at an Islamic high school. I taught from the local public school's health textbook, and studies have shown that comprehensive sex education programs reduce the rate of sexual activity and risky behavior. 
But what I noticed was that I had to find myself having to edit and change the lessons to better fit the needs of the Muslim students. For example, rather than talking about waiting until age 21 to drink alcohol, as was promoted in the chapter on intoxicants, we instead spoke about the physical, mental, social, and spiritual risks of alcohol consumption, how to say no, how to deal with peer pressure, and alternative ways to entertain and hang out with your friends as you get close to legal, legal drinking age. I also found myself rewriting chapters to include the Islamic rulings to topics like menstruation and hygiene, as well as adding the Quran and Hadith references to better support topics like healthy eating or highly stigmatized topics in the Muslim community like mental illness, abuse, feeling like you don't belong, bullying, how the prophet, peace be upon him, was bullied himself, how he dealt with it, um, topics of racism and how the prophet, peace be upon him, was an advocate for anti-racism and a supporter of women's rights to better nurture the topic at hand. Islamic schools do not have an Islamic health curriculum or textbook of their own, but there is definitely a need for it. I presented this topic at the 2019 ISNA Education Forum as the Imana Education Chair. And a majority of the Islamic school administrators, educators, and parents themselves, they agreed that yes, we need our own health education program tailored to the needs of our youth. Young American Muslims, they are one of the fastest growing demographics in the US. 37% of Muslims are under the age of 30. And some of the real issues and challenges that they are going through are strongly related to health topics. Education, it's one of the rights of every Muslim, and this does not just pertain to acts of worship, but all areas of knowledge. Islam is a religion that strongly believes that religion and science, that they're not at a discourse. Islam has congruence with all forms of knowledge, including health. And we as Muslim medical professionals, we can provide that for our community. In fact, many scholars like the famous theologian El Ghazali, he considered teaching health to be a communal obligation. That if you are a healthcare professional, you are fulfilling that obligation. And by the will of God, it would be considered an act of worship. Long hours working, studying, stressing over patients, going to conventions to learn more, practicing your skills, taking time to go on medical relief trips. These are all considered to be spiritual acts of worship when done with that intention. It's when we fail to address our community needs, like prioritizing the next generation's health education, that can leave them without an adequate understanding of who they are, as well as be able to better prepare them for adulthood. Furthermore, learning such topics solely from simply just a secular setting without supplementation by parents or the community can lead to a lot of confusion and negative influence within their mindset. It may attribute to why some feel enticed to engage in risky behaviors that are harmful to their mental and physical health, um, why they may succumb to peer pressure, and some may even develop religious doubt and leave Islam altogether. As a 2015 study by Pew found that about 20% of Muslim youth leave Islam by the time they reach adulthood. The Institute of Social Policy and Understanding, it reported that Muslim youth deal with the same challenges as any other youth, like sexual desire, drug and alcohol use, and online safety. But they also deal with unique issues like anti-Islamic sentiment that leads to bullying, discrimination, and racial profiling. And what ISPU recommended was that Islamic institutions provide Muslim youth with a learning environment that, can that caters to their needs. So it was from this experience with teaching health in Muslim communities that I decided to write a health textbook series for Muslim youth that aims to teach youth health topics with evidence-based medicine and the Islamic way of life at the forefront of its answers. It is considered to be a comprehensive health textbook. So therefore it covers all areas of health. And just to note on reproductive and sexual health, Reproductive and sexual health tend to be the two most stigmatized health topics to both teach and learn about. But what's very interesting is that they're also the two most heavily discussed topics in the books of Islamic jurisprudence. In both Bukhari and Muslim, the two hadith sources with the highest authenticity, 
they discuss an array of reproductive and sexual health topics. So, you know, subhanAllah, there's really no other religion that has provided sexual and reproductive health education. Islam is very unique in that way. The Prophet, peace be upon him, he showed from his example that it's not prohibited to ask, nor is it prohibited uh, to teach. It's vital for us to teach all areas of health, including those that are sensitive, uh, without introducing feelings of shame or embarrassment. So the health textbook series is called Islamic Health. And to ensure that the topics are age appropriate, it is broken down into two books. Book one is for the middle school age and up, and it's currently out now on Amazon. As you can see on the left of the chart are the six areas of health, and on the right side are the chapters that correspond to that area. For reproductive and sexual health, that includes the chapter on puberty, then reproductive and reproduction and menstruation, and hygiene. Under physical health, it discusses healthy living, such as nutrition, fitness, common injury, sleep, lifestyle diseases. Social health discusses relationship rights, the rights that children have towards other Muslims, their parents, and to non-Muslims. Um, community relationships discusses how Islam is an altruistic religion, and we are to give in charity, help those in poverty, the oppressed, orphans, those with disabilities, as well as caring for the environment and advocating for anti-racism, as well as women's rights. And then mental health and spiritual health include the chapter on self-esteem, which discusses how family and family life, like divorce and abuse and grief, influence a child's self-esteem, as well as uh, peer pressure, peer influence, body image, and of course, dealing with episodes of poor mental health and mental illness. And then finally is the chapter on entertainment. This chapter talks about the good and bad of video games and social media, as well as the, um, the dealings with sexually explicit content. I'd like to briefly highlight a few areas within some of these chapters. In chapter one on puberty, the chapter begins with emphasizing how Islam helps children prepare for puberty before they're even going through it, before it even happens. For example, by the time a child turns age seven, they are encouraged by their parents to knock on their door at three specific times of the day, typically when the parents may be changing or are alone together. Um, and then as they get older by age 10 to match their emotional, intellectual, and spiritual growth, they are then to knock at every time they enter a person's personal space. They are also told to have the, their own separate bedding and not to sleep with a sibling or a parent or a grandparent or a cousin, but to have their own place to sleep. And also that they are to ensure privacy when using the bathroom. These rulings that by the time they do hit puberty, they have now prepared them for ownership, a sense of empowerment that their body is their own and that private parts are to be respected. This enables the parent to easily discuss a topic like consent to their child, such as um, someone asking them for a hug or being alone with someone, including someone who's a family member or a mahram, that they can at least have this understanding of this empowerment towards their own body. Uh, it also teaches them, number two, personal boundaries, that if a child is to knock on another person's door or sleep by themselves, that others are to give them those same boundaries. And then finally, number three is that it teaches them confidence. To talk about sensitive topics has already been occurring throughout their young life, that by the time they hit puberty, they've already started the conversation. So now it's just simply this open dialogue that is to continue with their parents as opposed to start when they have now hit puberty. And then after which the chapter then goes into the physical, mental, and spiritual changes of puberty. In chapter two, it discusses reproduction and menstruation. Uh, this chapter explains the process of reproduction, the menstrual cycle, menstrual products, as well as the FIC rulings of menstruations, which are based on the courses at Mishke University, where I received my associate's degree in Islamic studies. But this chapter also discusses breaking cultural myths surrounding menstruation. One of which is that Islam does not view menstruation nor childbirth or pregnancy as a punishment to women. It considers them a blessing that's only given to women. There are certain acts, certain acts such as salah that one is to avoid until their menstruation ends. 
but it's not because a woman is considered to be spiritually impure. A Muslim is never considered spiritually impure. Rather, it's simply a ritual impurity, such when someone uses the bathroom and they need to purify themselves before they pray, that, it, that is in the same way. Uh, it also discusses the importance of talking to males about menstruation as well. There are many Muslim women who have dealt with being ignorantly accused of skipping prayers or fasts or even being taught or encouraged to lie and pretend pray or pretend fast. This is proof that our community is not doing enough to provide proper outlets to learn about health from both the male and female perspective. Chapter three discusses hygiene. It talks about how Islam values looking presentable, that there's nothing wrong with wanting to dress nice, look nice, smell nice, but also at the same time is teaching the child that they are to dress for self-respect and not for others or not for, you know, to impress another person, um, but in fact, to build body positivity and self-confidence. This chapter also discusses common uh, hygienic issues during this age, such as dealing with acne and body odor, along with some unique Islamic rulings in regards to nocturnal emissions, as well as other um, unique hygienic needs, such as the hadith regarding the five. In extension is that it also talks about very common reproductive health issues in males and females. An example is testicular torsion. Testicular torsion is very common in the ages of 12 through 18. It's considered to be a medical emergency. This chapter discusses some of the warning signs and symptoms. Another example is testicular cancer. It's the most common cancer in males between the ages of 15 and 35. This chapter discusses testicular self exams. And in regards to the female reproductive illnesses, it talks about toxic shock syndrome uh, and avoid using super absorbent tampons and to change them regularly. It talks about endometriosis and how some women, young women struggle with missing school or events due to severe and intense menstrual pain, as well as PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome, which can greatly affect a young woman's self-esteem in regards to some of its symptoms. And so this chapter also talks about coping with symptoms that are related to body image. And then the final chapter that we'll talk about for book one is the chapter on healthy living. This chapter starts with talking about nutrition and how the Quran emphasizes the importance of eating from the six essential nutrients that we are to reflect on what we eat. But it also talks about how Islam recognizes that not every person in the world is able to access healthy food and clean water. So one of the first ways of caring for our own physical health is to be appreciative. At the same time is to recognize the abundant access that many of us have to food. And with that comes an awareness to eat in moderation. Having a healthy relationship with food is a very important concept to teach at a young age. This chapter explains the distinction and the difference between appetite and hunger. That hunger is a need. It's a cue from the body that you are in need of nutrients for survival. If we ignore those hunger cues, we may become underweight or malnourished, especially when the right foods are not being consumed. Appetite, on the other hand, it's a cue from our brain. If we over respond to it, we may become overweight, develop an unhealthy relationship with food, such as eating when we feel bored or sad or stressed out. One of the most effective ways to be able to teach our children to make this distinction is to talk to them about intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting was established in the Islamic tradition long before the medical community uh, recommended it. Intermittent fasting is something that has uh, numerous research studies uh, that show how beneficial it is for our health. Now we, of course, we intermittent fast during Ramadan, but we are also highly encouraged to do it uh, a couple times a month or at least once a week. And this is a great way we can teach our child um, who is at the age to do so uh, as a way to be able to distinguish better between appetite and hunger. Also is to eat or choose healthy uh, carbohydrates with a low glycemic index. That's foods that make us feel full for longer and give us more energy over a long period of time. This is highly encouraged for us to do during the pre-dawn meal when we fast as a way to help us uh, make our fast easy for us. And an example is when the prophet, peace be upon him, told us that uh, a sunnah or recommendation from him 
An example from him is that we are to eat dates. Dates have a very low glycemic index. So we can carry that out throughout uh, the way that we choose to eat and what it is that we choose to eat, not just for breakfast, but for other meals of the day. Fitness is also discussed. Um, what's very interesting about fitness is that it was a difficult um, to figure out where in the book to put this in regarding to the in regarding the areas of health because it helps us more and it helps us in many different areas of health than just physical health. As we know, it obviously benefits us physically, but it's highly connected to our mental health. There is a strong link between feeling happy and physical activity. Exercise has been shown to improve our mood, lower feelings of sadness, anxiety, and stress. Uh, it can also change parts of the brain that regulate stress and anxiety. It also benefits our social health, that when you are a part of an organized sport, that you're more likely to have high levels of self-esteem, you're more likely to have more friends, develop leadership skills, um, team building skills, and you're more likely to have determination to, to achieve long-term goals. Fitness is also highly connected to our spiritual health. We are very much a physical faith in terms of our acts of worship. There is a wonderful book called Pilgrimage Ready, Healthy and Strong, and it tracked the distance per ritual that we do when we perform Umrah and Hajj. And what it found was that Hajj is like completing a, the entire duration of Hajj is like completing a half marathon. That being said, Islam is not a religion that's meant to burden us, but it shows that if we are physically capable and we have, we have this long-term consistent maintenance uh, with our physical health and physical activity, that we're able to perform even our acts of worship uh, in the best way. So those are just a few points uh, in regard to book one. By the grace of God, alhamdulillah, the book has been endorsed by the Council of Islamic Schools of North America, the Islamic Schools League of America, the Family and Youth Institute, as well as MASS, the Muslim American Society Youth uh, Ministry. Uh, I'd also like to remark that uh, and to note that uh, the book has been content edited by Dua Hagag. She is a licensed mental health professional, and she works as an educator at the Family and Youth Institute. The graphics for the book were completed by Gensis Alio. He's the creative director at Imana, and he uh, did a wonderful job ensuring that the book was age appropriate and fun for youth. Book one is out now. If you're interested in getting it, it's available on Amazon. As for book two, book two is coming out inshallah, by the end of this year. And book two is for the high school age. So it's ages 14 and up. It is also comprehensive, so it includes the six areas of health, and you can see the topics that correspond to that on the right. I would like to make a few notes on this book as well and highlight a few aspects of the chapters. For the chapter on sexual desire and intimacy, feeling attracted to another person is a key sign that you are growing up. These feelings are normal and they are expected. In fact, there are certain hormones that are released in a person's body during puberty, such as dopamine and oxytocin, that cause a person to feel this way. Some Muslims develop feelings of sexual guilt, but this is cultural. This is not from Islam. Feeling sexual is a part of our biological makeup that Allah has bestowed on us. And in fact, Islam has a very positive view of intimacy in a marriage that having a healthy physical relationship with your spouse is considered to be a form of worship and therefore rewardable. But being sexual with another person, it does come with a responsibility. So this chapter teaches our youth that they are responsible for learning how to channel these feelings appropriately. And when they can take control over it, then they lose its power to control them. Islam gives several preventive tools to help control sexual desire, one of which is lowering the gaze. This includes um, sexually explicit content. This is a great struggle for many youth, including Muslim youth. For example, in 2013, the Canadian Muslim Youth Helpline, Nesiha, they reported that 100% of the calls from Muslim boys ages 11 to 14 were about their addiction to pornography and masturbation. Watching pornography or pornographic material, it has very severe and long-term side effects. 
a distorted view on what sex is, how a healthy relationship looks, being less sensitive to violence against women. It's also more likely to lead one to anxiety and depression. There's wonderful resources that this book provides um, for those who may be struggling and may need may, may be in need of greater guidance um, that are cited within the book. Another um, tool to help control sexual desire is fasting. Uh, we talked about fasting as a way to control our feelings of hunger versus appetite, but fasting is something that helps us to control uh, our, ourselves in many different ways. And it's a great action measure to take and to encourage our youth to take that sometimes they automatically gravitate towards masturbation or self-stimulation. Um, but this is a wonderful action measure that they can take either doing so once a week or a couple times a month. Number two is choosing good company. Helping our child being able to distinguish a good friend from a friend with poor decision-making skills can help them prevent them from risky behavior as well uh, as uh, being able to understand the difference between peer pressure or wanting to impress their peers versus what is greater and better for them in the long run. And finally, number four is to learn the risks. Media often portrays sex as normal and consequence free and that everyone is doing it. It rarely highlights the risks and dangers that come with it. Dr. Sobia Ali Faisal, she performed, <clears throat> she performed a study and she found that Muslim youth's greatest source of sex education is media. Entertain entertainment media, it overgeneralizes reality. In the real world, engaging in casual sexual activities is incredibly risky. It has physical, mental, spiritual, and social risks. Sadly, she also found from the survey that parents are the least likely source of sex education. As she said, parents aren't, take, aren't talking about issues of sex and sexual health. So the school systems need to provide this education. Controlling sexual urges and desires for companionship or you know, wanting to be with someone has become one of the greatest struggles for Muslim youth. It's not enough for one to think, oh, my child goes to Islamic school, they're good, uh, because our children definitely need more. As Dr. Samira Ahmed, executive director of FYI said, there's a false assumption that Muslim kids are protected by their faith and religious practice and are not engaging in premarital sex, that they struggle with what any other youth in America is going to struggle with. So it's not enough for us as parents to say sex outside of marriage is prohibited. They need to know how as discussed and the why to learn about some of the physical risks, such as STD or pregnancy, what, what, how and what contraception is used for, the mental risks, such as dating solely because one feels lonely or wanting to fit in or understanding the risks of sexual violence, the social risks, that we are like a fabric of society, that we're all connected together and people's social habits and mannerisms impact another person. And of course, finally, the spiritual risks, the guidelines in Islam, they're not meant, as Dali Mughal had said, they're not meant to restrict us, but they are to help us, that they are there to protect us and to help us make good rational decision-making skills uh, for ourselves in the long run. And until then, we're, in, we're to teach our child to enjoy their youthful age, that they are so much more than a person just looking for love, that they're an individual with goals and aspirations and that they should embrace them that they should strive to live a life where in their youthful age and they're not tied down to another person to volunteer or work or study or be with their friends or travel, that they not solely restrict their youth to being attached to another person. The next chapter is on intoxicants. This is a very important topic for our youth because it's a frequently asked question by their peers. And in reality, it really is a struggle that many of them are dealing with. Knowing the why, why intoxicants are prohibited, it can help them overcome peer pressure and build confidence in living a sober life. For example, in regards to the effects of alcohol, we know that it can lead to cancer, heart disease, pregnancy complications, as well as psychological illness, that those who drink may use it simply as a coping mechanism to deal with depression or a past trauma um, or as a form of escape. And being able to be given an opportunity to talk with a mental health professional can teach them healthy coping mechanisms. 
we are also to teach our children to feel proud, uh, you know, to be able to proud to say no or to be assertively be able to handle peer pressure in that way. This book also gives stories of Muslims who were addicted and now are sober and them sharing their story. A great example is Omar radiallahu an, who wanted to protect people from alcohol uh, because he had firsthand experience with it. As he made dua and he said, oh Allah, make this matter of alcohol intoxicants as clear as it can be for us. Lastly is that this chapter teaches us that if the child themselves or someone they know is addicted, that we as a community are to help them and not shame them. That addiction is very much a form of disease and it truly is something that even though one wants to quit, that it's very difficult for them to do so, but not impossible, especially when they have social support. An example of this is in the final stages of the prohibition of alcohol during the time of the prophet, peace be upon him, Many companions quit alcohol very easily, but some still struggled. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, dealt with them with compassion and mercy. One of them was caught drinking and a fellow companion said, Oh Allah, curse him. How frequently has he been brought with this same charge? And the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Don't, don't curse him. For by Allah, I know he loves Allah and his apostle. And then finally, before we close, is the chapter on mental health and illness. Research has found that a person with strong faith is more likely to have strong mental health. According to the book Psychology from the Islamic Perspective by Dr. Aisha Utz, she states that over 500 medical studies have found a significant positive association between religiosity and mental well being. That being said, anyone, including a righteous Muslim, can deal with episodes of poor mental health where their thinking and mood and behavior is affected. Mental health is very much like a spectrum. There may be seasons of life where it is at its optimum and other times when it is at its low point, but the danger comes when a person feels stuck on a level of dysfunction and they're unable to deregulate that stress. Muslim youth are very much tested in unique ways from their American uh, peers. One example is Islamophobia and feeling like they don't belong. It's reported that in a survey that 42% of Muslim parents with children in K through 12th grade reported bullying uh, from their children as a result of their faith in comparison to people of other faiths. In addition, FYI found that 15 to 25% of American Muslims report anxiety disorders and that Muslim youth dealing with bullying and shame all in the name of being Muslim has led to a weakening in their faith and their well-being as well as a higher likelihood of engaging in risky behavior. Solutions that we can teach our children and that this book talks about is the importance in being confident in who they are. That embracing American culture wholeheartedly doesn't make you uh, more American than others. That it's your land, we shouldn't feel that we need to prove our Americanness and so they should feel proud to be Muslim. Research shows that Muslims who are confident in their faith and who have friends, um, that they're more likely to value their religion and feel like they can fit in. And what's very interesting about this study by Yaqeen is that it didn't look at how religious a person's friends are, but simply that they were Muslim. It enabled them to feel like they were included and that they had some sense of connection with another person. And then finally is mental illness. Mental illness is extremely common. It affects one in four people worldwide. It is multifactorial. It is due to a number of issues, whether it's genetics or hormones, biology, um, trauma, abuse, uh, the way that a person copes. Um, And it's sadly a very highly stigmatized issue in the Muslim community. Many Muslims have incorrect and false understandings about how mental health arises, if it's even a true medical illness. Some say things like mental illness doesn't happen to a true believer. There's no such thing if you are a true Muslim. Oh, it's not depression. You just need to read more Quran. You just need to pray more. This can make those living with manageable mental illness less likely to seek treatment. The prophets of God who were of the highest level of faith, they themselves struggled with mental health issues, that it showed the humanness of them. The Prophet, peace upon him, for example, he dealt with a series of losses. It's reported that in one year, he didn't even smile at the loss of his wife and his uncle. But again, his 
Um, his faith was never questioned. It was never marked to him that he stopped praying or he should pray more, but it was a recognized feeling. It is not a sign of weak faith. In fact, as Dr. Rani Awad points out, clinical psychiatrist at Stanford, she found that in fact, that if you are dealing with issues of poor mental health, it may be even a sign that God loves you, that Allah tests those whom he tests the most. This book also focuses heavily on the topic of suicide. Suicide is the second leading cause of death amongst 15 to 29 year olds. And a recent study by JAMA, by the Journal of the American Medical Association of Psychiatry, it found that, and the lead researcher was Dr. Rani Awad, she found that Muslim adults in the U.S. were twice as likely to report a history of suicide attempt compared with individuals from other faith traditions. I think, sadly, we can probably say that almost every one of us knows of a Muslim who has committed suicide or who has attempted suicide. There were Muslims, even during the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, who struggled with suicidal thoughts. And the way that he dealt with them was through strong and uh, strong compassion and empathy. <clears throat> he did not question their faith or, that, or their Islam, but he very much offered them advice and support. It's important that our youth understand the warning signs as well as family members as well. Families understand the warning signs or some of the, um, some of the signs and symptoms that can be found in those who are contemplating suicide. Research shows that four out of five teens who attempt suicide do give clear warnings. So for that child, if they themselves or someone they know is, then we encourage them to seek a trusted adult and seek medical help immediately. Finally is the discussion on the treatment of episodes of poor mental health and mental illness, that God says that there is a cure for everything uh, except for old age, and that includes, of course, uh, mental illness. This book discusses many treatment options for dealing with episodes of poor mental health, such as um, self-help mental health treatment, such as um, your relationship with God, managing thoughts and strong emotions, such as anger and envy, holistic care, taking care of what you eat, um, how much sleep you get, your exercise, um, your hygiene, creativity, encouraging um, youth to paint and to do photography and to um, explore art because art therapy is something which is shown to be quite effective um, in episodes of poor mental health, as well as going out in nature, getting some vitamin D, as well as uh, being around the creation of God and spending time with loved ones. It also discusses the conventional or professional treatment, um, such as psychotherapy and medications, as well as support groups and hospitalization. And it also lists at the end of the book are um, resources that are available, one of which is the, um, the array of Muslim mental health resources and counseling services that are available if a person chooses to seek a medical health professional that is Muslim. So this concludes... Um, some of the chapters that I wanted to kind of point out in book two, book two, again, is coming out later this year. Um, it is not out yet, uh, but it will be out soon. Uh, book one and book two, they have evidence-based medical research, um, as well as Islamic information, which comes from Mishkei University. Again, both books have been content edited by Dua Hagag from FYI. My hope is that the textbook series can be used at Islamic schools or homeschooling or as an alternative credit um, for public school health course, um, possibly as a, offered in Islamic weekend schools or youth events. Of course, it is a, res or a resource that parents can use with their child and um, for children on their own or for adults as well. I hope that this serves a need in our community and that it provides a great benefit to our Muslim youth. Please forgive me for any of my shortcomings or mistakes. If you have any questions or any comments right now, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you again. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Khan. Uh, presentation was very, very informative, mashallah. And uh, definitely uh, we need this going forward, especially during these times and um, in the future, inshallah. Um, one question I had was uh, for the book on Amazon, what, somebody was asking, what is the cost uh, for the series book one that you have available? Book one is available on Amazon at, for $69.99. $69.99, okay. Okay, perfect. Question just popped up. Uh, so here, what is the process by which we can advocate 
this being used in Islamic schools? Uh, thank you, Layla, for the question. Um, so in regards to Islamic schools using the um, the health textbook. Um, so the book is being in, the book is endorsed by the um, and I'll put it back up here. Um, the book is endorsed by CISNA as well as ISLA. And they have very graciously um, shared the book um, with uh, the Islamic schools that are affiliated with those organizations. Um, I'm also doing a webinar with ISLA um, in September. I'm sorry, September 27th. Um, <clears throat> And uh, in order to kind of get the word out more for the Islamic schools, um, as well as uh, if your child goes to Islamic school or you have one in your local community, um, please feel free to um, email them or message them, share them, share with them the book. Uh, the session is recorded. Please feel free to um, you can link the imana.org education uh, webinar link so that way they can maybe learn more about the book. Um, and I apologize. I'm going to zoom again all the way down to the bottom of my screen. And I'll share with you my contact information if they would like to reach out to me um, and if they have any questions or they want further information. Uh, my email is the Islamic Health Education at gmail.com, or they, of course, can um, contact me through Instagram uh, at Islamic Health Series. Perfect. Oh, there was one question also from Anonymous. Uh, which generations of which generations of kids will this book help the most? The book one is for the book one is for the middle school age, so age nine and up. Um, and the second book is book two is for 14 and up. So it can help starting at the middle school age. And then for the book two, it could be for the high school, college, or even um, older age range. And we, there is discussion about doing a elementary school um, book uh, in the future. Okay, perfect. And, and also the other question was, um, it was, I think it's a similar, they were saying which ones you as an author would like to impact for the better with this book? I think that um, book one feels to me more like a precursor to book two. The book two is really the health education book, whereas book one focuses more on the puberty aspect as well as menstruation, the beginning stages of becoming an adult, whereas book two really aligns more with the classic health test textbook that you see in a public school. Um, and so just having book two in and of itself is sufficient. Um, book two is kind of for that, that being able to kind of ease one into the into the heavier and more mature and sensitive topics that are found in book two. Uh, that being said, book one is quite often referenced throughout book two. Um, so they do definitely um, go hand in hand. But if someone, for example, has only high schoolers um, and they have already, you know, provided that knowledge on puberty or menstruation um, and self-esteem or what have you, some of those topics are carried over in book two, but book two would be um, sufficient as well just for them. Jazakallah khair again. Uh, we'll uh, we'll end this with uh, Surah Asr. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal Asr inna al-insana lafi khusr illa al-ladhina amanu wa amilu al-salihat wa tawasaw bil-haqqi wa tawasaw bil-sabr. By the passage of time, surely humanity is in grave loss, except those who have faith do good and urge each other to the truth and urge each other to perseverance and patience. Thank you again, Dr. Khan. Uh, we're Thank you, really, Rehan. really pleased to have you today, and uh, I hope we have many more to come in the future, inshallah, and uh, and everything that you do for Imana uh, as being the chair of the education committee. Uh, thank you again, and uh, inshallah, have a great day. Thank you. You too. Assalamu alaikum. Take care. Assalamu alaikum.